So um, this is a topic I actually get so many questions and from the beginning till the end. So we <laughs> leave it to the last uh, section is how to integrate metabolomics with other omics. Oh, we will talk about multi-omics, but uh, including metabolomics. So um, uh, what we would like to show in this last module is to understand the multi-omics study designs and um, involving metabolomics. So what are the common study designs? And because based on this one, we are going to introduce the different strategies, how to integrate them. So my lab actually um, in uh, past uh, decades, we already starting uh, how do we integrate metabolomics with different omics. So we actually have a lot of tools and to do that. So we are gonna introduce some of the tools and um, there's no demo, but uh, it's relatively designed to uh, similarly like metabolomics, you should be able to follow and it's, um, uh, it should be easy. So we do in metabolomics, but we know metabolomics a relatively smaller, smaller field, okay, compared to genomics, compared to microbiome. And now there's a new field called the foodomics and exposomics. So metabolomics are really unique. So you can see uh, metabolomics at intersecting with a lot of the field. So, and you cannot, um, uh, really understanding biology without knowing metabolomics. But on the other hand, it's uh, true. If we just focus on metabolomics, ignore genomics and uh, uh, environmental microbiome, we won't be able to understand biology. So overall, that uh, the future is integration, multiomics. And um, I think metabolomics, uh, hopefully, the last missing link to this um, omics family. And we should be able to integrate and focus on biology and focus on the data rather than focus on the, uh, the very uh, raw data fundamentals. Okay. So if we uh, put the metabolomics uh, as a bait and we think about what type of the things can be linked to metabolomics because we are talking about biologically system biology. So genetics, how they influence metabolomics. There's a well-published study since, uh, I think since 2008, the concept of genetically influenced metabolites or genes. And uh, there's also microbial influenced metabolites or so microbial um, contributed metabolites. Some is unique, some is shared with the host. So it's uh, microbial means. So we also know a diet and we eat and some metabolites are going to change and exposure. So for example, drugs and uh, uh, gluten, they are going to show up on your blood, the urines. So a lot of the studies on the uh, exposures and um, toxicologies, we need to uh, understand this. Overall, that uh, metabolomics at the center in a lot of these uh, intersections and uh, functions. So um, at the early stage, we talk about the integration of metabolomics with other data. And the easiest one, or most intuitive one, is uh, integrating metabolites with genes. So we want to see if I detect these genes changed, the metabolites changed. Can we see whether the a certain pathways change it? So uh, the hypothesis is that if the genes uh, upregulated the metabolites change it, they probably, this pathway involving both enzymes and uh, metabolites will be more likely to be changed. So we put them together in a in the pathway and uh, and uh, we can do the analysis. So this is very reasonable and um, actually a lot of people are doing it uh, manually. So what we have done is put it in metabol analyst and uh, let people to do it uh, uh, using web interface. And uh, one of the things we found is hard, but we managed to get it done is how do we get a peaks there? Because the peak also, <laughs> Uh, can be meaningful. How could we integrate peaks uh, together with genes? And this is a part called joint pathway analysis. You should explore if you have peaks or compounds and the genes. So um, if we really think about the joint pathway analysis and uh, we have the two types of inputs, significant genes from RNA-seq at microarray and a compound peak list. And we want to project them in the pathway and do enrichment analysis. So how do we do that? One is at a feature level. So uh, we can directly uh, merge uh, genes and metabolites together and uh, project into like a one single list and project into pathways. 
which the pathway definition will include both gene and metabolites. Then we do enrichment analysis, like a single omics. So we just merge them, mix them, um, uh, and the library also contains both of them. So we can treat them as a one to do that, which seems simple and uh, e easy to do. Uh, and um, metabolites will allow you to do that. Uh, the issue here is that uh, imbalance. And uh, a lot of times we know transcriptomics more complete. You can get a lot of signaling genes, like hundreds, but you only get about 10 metabolites significant. If you're doing the integration, you will find yourself. The biology was dominated by the transcriptomics. So that's usually true. Okay. The other part, uh, once we want to do is the pathway level integration. So we can do a metabolomics data uh, uh, pathway analysis and genomics, uh, transcriptomics data analysis and get a signal pathways. And we can integrate the pathway based on their p-values. So this is a, uh, uh, more later. So in this case, we can slightly address the in imbalance of the um, feature level. So we move it later because p-value is slightly more uh, tolerant. So, so overall that uh, we are not saying which one is, uh, uh, is best and when to do what. We just tell you both are reasonable, but there's also shortcomings and you are welcome to try. And the metabolites just give you a platform and let you try without writing a code. Uh, that's, uh, um, so um, this is the one we just talking about uh, what we try to uh, address is um, one is uh, like uh, feature level and uh, uh, be aware if your feature is comparable and uh, you, they are more, more or less fine. If your feature not com not comparable, it could be dominated by a uh, single omics. And the later pathway, level, uh, pathway level integration is more similar to meta-analysis. So um, uh, basically you calculate the p-values for your pathways and integrate the p-values. And how do we integrate the p-values? This is a, uh, a lot of well-established methods, such as the Fisher's method, uh, or it's called the Stouffer's method, and you can actually combine them. Sometimes you can integrate in the uh, weight you know, and to emphasize the more stronger p-values or high quality uh, data set. So this is uh, used in the meta-analysis. In this case, when you're integrating p-values, we can actually integrate the peaks direct with genes. Just because we did, uh, we just mentioned using mami uh, we can directly project the peaks, uh, use peaks to get a pathway significance. And uh, if in that case, we get the pathway p-values, we can uh, integrate them with the p-values based on gene, genes, transcriptomics. So we were able to do the pathway level integration for untargeted metabolomics and transcriptomics. And uh, for the targeted metabolomics, you can do either way, either using pathway level or feature level. So um, we realized the challenges of uh, analyzing different data. And starting with metabolomics, uh, metabol analysts, which uh, I did it uh, during my PhD, and continue to upgrade and uh, um, and maintain, and it's getting um, uh, very popular. But uh, also, there's other tools we are continue to update, and the the one below metabol analyst is called Express Analyst, and uh, which is actually for RNA transcriptomic state analysis. We just published a niche communication early this year. And uh, it is really for RNA-seq and uh, for both model species and model and non-model species. So one of our focus is really not just uh, more than human, because if human seems a lot of things being solved, especially for the transcriptomics. But a lot of issues uh, for non-model species, you need to um, assemble and annotate genomes or transcriptomes. And what we found is, which is very hard for um, uh, for non-model species. What we have done is we use um, a much more efficient uh, approaches. You can directly do the RNA data analysis and get to biology without doing the annotation and uh, uh, assembly. So uh, uh, if you have a study on non-model species doing the RNA you should uh, try this one. And if you use the Blast2Go before, and this is a, a new generation uh, of Blast2Go. And uh, the one uh, on the bottom is called a microbiome an analyst. And we just published version two this year. And before there was a niche protocol, and which is uh, uh, basically we are actively supporting microbiome data analysis. And it have a lot of modules, actually very, very close to MetaBanalyst. We have also um, thousands of citations um, um, 
hundreds of thousands of users. So this part is actually um, uh, quite a um, popular tools for that. So beyond this uh, uh, main stem omics, we also have a lot of the other tools to help uh, to do other, other omics and multi omics. Uh, for example, we have network analyst for the gene based uh, uh, integration, how the um, protein protein interactions, uh, transcription, fact transcription factors, and the tissue specific uh, um, expressions. A lot of lot of the system biology for the gene or gene list. You should try to use network analyst, which is uh, uh, quite popular also. And if you think about the cytoscape for the gene expression data, and this is one, but it's online and uh, with a very uh, good uh, in, uh, graphical interface and uh, network uh, visualization. And uh, multi-omics, you can see the second column, and we have the microRNA based and uh, network analysis, MGUS, which uh, well, I'm, I'm going to introduce is uh, basically how to in integrate the SNPs with uh, metabolites. And the omics net and omics analyst is the two general approaches allow you to uh, integrate in the signatures from different omics data or directly using a data driven approaches uh, from different data tables. So it's targeting different input and give you more flexible um, uh, uh, control. So the last part is uh, more on algorithms and databases. So we a lot of them is underlying a lot of the tools above because we need to have some um, annotations and um, and knowledge base to help um, to help uh, the uh, to help the hyperlinking or um, um, or understanding. So the, my next one is uh, uh, focus on how do we link uh, actually uh, metabolomics to genomics. So before I al already mentioned about joint pathway analysis, which is uh, aiming to link metabolomics with transcriptomics based on the significant genes and uh, uh, and metabolites of um, pigs and the genes. Now, uh, the main part here, we are talking about the linking metabolomics with SNPs. Genomics uh, is we, we are focused on SNPs, which uh, have some uh, downstream functions. And um, what uh, the field try to do using genomics and metabolomics is called MGUS. Basically, they call the uh, metabolites or metabolomics based genome wide association studies. So the uh, scan people's the SNPs using a SNP array, basically genotyping everybody, also marrying their met metabolomics uh, profiles and using some uh, kit or, or, uh, or um, uh, array based uh, platform. Then they try to associate the SNPs and uh, unique genotypes with their metabolic concentrations. So this is similar to a, a traditional GUS. Basically, you see the SNPs associated with some disease phenotypes, but in this time, there's no disease phenotypes actually using the metabolite concentrations at the end, end point as a phenotype, molecular phenotype. So far, there's about 65 studies. They have um, um, uh, published so far. So we actually manually curating all of them and use their raw data and try to apply consistent uh, cutoffs and uh, and get uh, this studies together. Overall is that uh, uh, they have about uh, 4,000 metabolites being married and uh, and some uh, include, oh, there's, uh, then there's uh, around 2,000 of 2,300 uh, of the metabolite ratio. And uh, what you found is metabolites is important. Sometimes you calculate the ratio can improve the signal. So they also count the other part. And the SNPs uh, is about 17,000. So here it's not about the SNP merit, it's SNPs that have a significant uh, correlation with metabolites. So here is that uh, we basically using a cutoff about uh, popularly used 10 to minus uh, 10 to. Uh, mm, 10 to minus 8. So this is a common cutoff for um, selecting significant uh, um, association in GWAS. So you can see mostly use the blood 
and urine, saliva, CSF. There's some one study in the uh, mitochondria. So overall, that uh, there's a lot of studies, and uh, they try to understand the genetic influenced uh, metabolite types. So we put uh, all of them together. We can uh, actually annotate uh, where they um, published uh, and uh, the pa paper and how many samples. You can see all the samples are quite large. The UK bio, this is the UK Biobank, UKBB, about a uh, half million uh, Europeans and uh, Armenish and some, some including South Asia. So um, each data, we uh, keep their unique ID uh, at the beginning. And you see the platforms, Biocrates, Metabolon, uh, Q-Executive. And uh, so there's a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the difference in the platform used. And the uh, cutoff threshold. So we try to respect what they used. So mostly it's uh, 10 to minus eight. But you can see here is, I guess this is an on target that you, you get more significant signals, you use a more stringent cutoff minus 12. And uh, uh, all the results, you can actually view them. So here is that one, uh, we choose the one I just showed here, uh, blood and the Q executive European origin about uh, eight, 9,000 uh, people. So if you click, you will see uh, what are uh, the main findings. This is a chromosome position. It's basically uh, 21, 22, all the chromosomes. And uh, the SNPs location is basically um, organized by the chromosome location. And the p-value is um, metabolites that uh, associate with them. And here's network view. And uh, you can see um, some of the SNPs, like uh, a SNP is identified by the ID, like RS296. This is uh, not a gene, so it's really have a SNP ID. You don't know clearly, but this is a unified ID and uh, associated with uh, <clears throat> peaks. I think some peaks annotated, some is not, just the MZ to RT intention. So a lot of them is really give you some ID stuff. Uh, this SNP is functional because the SNP change associated with the peak change. So this is an untargeted. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is, but for targeted, you'll get ID, okay? So this is um, a lot of studies. So um, uh, we uh, we collecting all the data. We also want to make people to understand how the genetic changes actually impact metabolic changes, okay? So the link is from SNPs to metabolites. And uh, we know from SNP to metabolites, we, there's a GWAS study and there's statistical analysis do the association. And we already know with a 10 to minus 0.8 and they are significant. And we just want to know why, why does SNP changes actually impact metabolites? So in between there must be a pathways, a regulatory pathways, right? And we also know that SNP associated with the disease. There's a lot more publication, a thousand publication on the GWAS study. It's associated means disease with uh, SNPs with disease. <clears throat> Actually, we also know SNP associated with genes and uh, um, uh, like uh, uh, QTL and, uh, and uh, quantitative treat low size. So the metab genomics and have a lot of, lot of data. They have the uh, downstream effect. And we also know the proteins from genes to protein, there's metabolites. So there's a lot of in-between uh, signaling and uh, uh, interaction pathways, we know it. So some of them actual transporter, actually a lot of the SNPs affecting transporters which affect metabolites. And uh, so uh, overall that uh, this is a uh, rich information and we know they are associated and, and we want to know why they are associated. This is a uh, kind of the, uh, intellectually, we are interested in. The other part is that uh, if, uh, so we would like to fulfill the knowledge gap, mechanistic uh, hints, why they are linked. On the other hand, we also want to uh, feel this uh, statistical link because actually there's a lot, a lot of significant uh, uh, connections. And you, you, you remember the uh, here, that's a tremendous, tremendous uh, large networks. How can we actually improve the signals from association to causality? So correlation and is only a few of the much less is a causal relationship. So uh, how do we how do we get that right? So um, it is uh, we always have a question for that. 
but the, when you have the SNPs, actually, uh, there is a way to actually address the causality. Uh, and uh, the method they call it here is called the Mandelian randomization. <clears throat> so uh, the, it is very intuitive, actually, because uh, our genetic doesn't change, okay? And uh, the inner population, then the different genotype or different allele frequency going to be distributed uh, from people uh, uh, randomly, okay? And uh, it's very similar to clinical uh, 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 randomized control trials. So the genetic, when you're doing this uh, um, inheritance and through this uh, um, random segregation of the alleles and doing the same similar thing. So wild type and have certain disease outcomes and variant, you, 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 you have this. So when you do this uh, filtering control the background, you can see uh, people accept this, uh, accept this variant, everything else, how, what's the chance they have this? So if the, if um, if we can control this variations using the genetic background, and we know the only difference is uh, these SNPs, and we know the SNPs also affect the phenotype is through this metabolites, and we know the metabolites have a causal effect of the um, uh, disease. Okay, so um, here is uh, actually a Mendelian randomization. If we really put on the scale, is that uh, we know a lot of association uh, between the genotype and disease, and we know a lot of association between here and MGVAS. MGVAS. How do we actually know they are correlated associated? Is uh, by leveraging uh, a lot of the GVAS. We know the genotype associated with the disease a lot, and if this one uh, uh, affecting disease and through this metabolites, and we can field out a lot of other co-founders, which is cause a lot of the correlations, but not a causal, just because we don't change this and we use this as a background control. So uh, fortunately, and there's a lot of lot of studies on the SNPs affecting the uh, uh, phenotype and um, uh, we can match them. So you have this uh, uh, MGWAS study, you can use also find a GWAS study to control the background and do the test. So uh, this is called a two sample uh, Mendelian randomization, and um, using that we can actually filter out a lot of a lot of the um, associations and identify which one is most likely to be causal. So uh, this is uh, uh, MGS Explorer, and we just published like uh, two or three days ago about version two, and uh, version one is really try to understand the. <clears throat> How do, what are the possible links between SNPs and metabolites and how the possible mechanistic uh, mechanisms between them. And the version two, many folks are Mendelian randomization. How can we field out the correlations and identify this more likely to be causal? And this is done through the Mendelian randomization. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to go to a very detailed demos on doing stuff, but the thing is that um, this is part of how, if you have SNPs and you study humans, and uh, you can really find uh, a lot of information from this website because it's integrating a lot of the GOS, MGOS, and uh, disease uh, phenotypes and all together. So you can see some of the results and, uh, and it's, it is some pathways, uh, not pathways, networks. So why we use networks is just because there's a lot of links and, uh, and you Go through them and think about it, and the field, and some of them is, will be highlighted just because you have more evidence. A lot of other things you probably can field out, and this is uh, generated from version one. And uh, version two, we have a filter. Basically, you can more focus on those and more likely to be causal. And we also <clears throat> performed a lot of the uh, large scale studies. And here is showing uh, uh, 800 metabolites and 200 and the three, 36 disease phenotypes. And uh, um, this one's past that um, Mendelian randomization. So um, we are more uh, feel this is more likely to be a correlate link. And we also manually check the top. A lot of them actually been uh, confirmed by other literature. So it's very interesting. And to know we can leverage uh, genomics to improve uh, and uh, uh, statistical um, analysis. And this is when uh, uh, we have this uh, very huge table, we just manually go through them and some of them have a 
very uh, interesting linking. For example, some of this uh, uh, serin associated with uh, atherosclerotic heart disease, and some of these uh, uh, carnitines associated with inflammatory bowel disease, and uh, some you can see some hormonal SNPs associated with them. What's the p-values? You see the p-values very very high, and if um, we do some literature search, you will see a lot of anecdotes report that talking about the link. Link is uh, it's likely to be true, but they are all anecdotes. Now we are talking about large scale studies. We merge multiple studies. We really found the significance very high. Um, but we are talking about tens of thousands of this, um, of this uh, uh, potential coral links. And so we definitely have no time to manually go through them, but this is published and uh, this is supplementary table. And uh, you can go through the website to interactive or you download the table to go through it yourself. And you will see that uh, uh, when you go to large scale studies and uh, potential leads is so high and to the point that uh, uh, it's overwhelming. And, um, and uh, uh, the other one is uh, uh, we also uh, did a lot of the test. And uh, if you really study one particular compound associated with some, uh, uh, how they associate with the phenotypes, and you can do the test doing Mandelian randomization using tools and see how many SNPs actually uh, can you can leverage to improve this causal link and see how co coherent the signal is and the slope will tell you what's likely to be causal or not, the strength. So overall that uh, if you are looking into this, uh, the uh, SNPs and metabolites and the disease, and this allow you to really go through it and focus on the evidence, focus on the uh, more deep. The table I showed the earliest summary, but if you're looking for individual, you can go to very deep and click to which studies give this uh, evidence, what you found, how big is population. And in human studies, you really need to match in the population. In Asia, uh, African, European, North American, they have different background and sometimes uh, they will make a difference. So that's uh, SNPs with uh, metabolomics. And uh, now we talk about the metabolomics with microbiome. And this is actually one of the key focus in my uh, study uh, because I believe uh, uh, the East as we talk about the gut microbiome and live inside our gut, how they impact our health and development and disease immunology. And a lot of things is uh, through the metabolites, it's bioactive metabolites. It do have some physical contact through the membrane, but majority is through the bioactive metabolites. And um, yes, a lot of people believe so. So there are a lot of study on this. And our group is unique, so we are more computational. So we're doing a lot of large studies. We really want to see how we can improve it in a large scale. So uh, uh, started, uh, how we started is so we want to see how we can just try from a smaller example. And um, uh, for example, tryptophan, and David mentioned yesterday about tryptophan is, is, is very important, but uh, uh, most of <clears throat> this we get uh, from uh, can get from food and uh, in, in, um, and get from uh, gut microbes actually can uh, uh, do a lot of transformation and some we're getting a result what some is beneficial some is actually detrimental and um, and so we know actually if we uh, uh, compare the microbes and based on their potential to to generate a chip fine versus a taxonomy, there's a huge difference. So taxonomy and versus a metabolic function is a huge difference. So we want to understand the functional microbes. We need to study their function my metabolites rather than, oh, this belong to this taxonomy genus. They must do the same thing. No, they are very different. So uh, here it shows that uh, they are uh, quite different. And uh, we actually collecting, manually collecting uh, based on literature and found out what are the possible pathways uh, microbiome can actually do based on gel models. And based on this knowledge, we actually build a very simple uh, basic logistic statistics to predict uh, how they are going to generate the um, uh, potential generate the um, uh, different uh, chip for metabolites. And we can we can do it uh, across different uh, uh, genus and uh, for human uh, mouse and uh, predict the different chip metabolites. We actually can marry them because we have collaborated. They actually have the samples. We can actually test them. And uh, 
we test a few of them. We also compare with uh, popular used uh, tools to do the prediction, such as PyCrust, text, text for fun. And uh, we, we tried and actually we can do better uh, job. So at least in this chip fun, and uh, we know we have a very accurate uh, model and we can use the statistics to actually predict well compared to most uh, other popular tools. And uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, so this part is uh, we did a uh, um, benchmarking and we also did a wet lab. And uh, in the end is uh, we uh, we go beyond the chip fan. We know it actually working generally across a lot of metabolites. Uh, it is fair to see uh, predict of meta metabolites based on a gem model, based on the uh, uh, stuff is really dependent on which metabolites you're interested in. Some metabolites predict very, very well. Some is still is uh, hard, which is not, uh, which is very true for a lot of uh, um, other algorithms. So, but overall it's very useful. So we created a tool, it's called a microbiome analyst. We just published version two and it's very, very uh, comprehensive. You can upload your microbiome data like the marker 16S, 18S or ITS uh, for fungi and you can do shotgun and uh, you can do um, some enrichment analysis like a taxon set enrichment analysis. And uh, here we show is how we actually can do metabolite microbiome, metabolomics microbiome data analysis integration. And uh, it is really based on what I just mentioned earlier. So when you upload uh, your uh, metabolomics and microbiome data together, and you can get a much meaningful result. Uh, the thing is that if you see the separation of this, uh, like this PCA, if you see this PCA, you see the separation between healthy and control. And you can see uh, this top microbes, which drives the separations of these um, groups. And what are their potential in generating the metabolites? Here you can see, actually we talk, plot in the heat map of the top uh, most significant uh, microbes, see their potential. You can see they have this unique, very standing out potential to, to, to generate uh, metabolites. It's very different from other microbes. That's, that's, not significant, that's not significant. So when you see that, you know their metabolic potential actually make them the driver uh, uh, very significant uh, contribute to this one. So this is called a mechanistic uh, insight. So when you integrate metabolites and uh, metabolomics with this uh, microbiome, you will get uh, the prediction and because you actually married, because you have metabolomics, you will see the consistency between the prediction and measurement. So overall, that um, um, this is a, quite a meaningful uh, result. So uh, the other part we can try to do is that uh, uh, when we try to understand uh, their functions, we do microbes, we use the CAC pathways, but the CAC pathway is really aggregated pathway. And uh, if we know their compositions, 16S, we can actually customize pathways. And then because if you don't have uh, the enzymes, you don't have that uh, pathways. So we can almost reduce the CAG pathway by half by uh, based on the 16S compositions. Then we use the more accurate CAG pathways to do the functional analysis. And you can get a more accurate pathway uh, enrichment result. And with this more in, uh, accurate enrichment result, you click on that, you actually see what type of the um, potentials. Oh, this is, uh, if you click each compound, you will see which microbes have the highest potential to generate them. And you can see the uh, from the uh, candidate list to the, see the potential. Overall, that, uh, the omics data analysis, including metabolic analyst, uh, microbiome analyst, is allow you to quickly, from your large scale data, to get to the least functional insight it does not give you a definite answer. This is this compound. This is this microbes. It's never the tools designed for. The tools designed for give you the most likely hints and it's up to you to do the next targeted analysis. Grow that microbes or do more isotope labeling to really find out it is true or not. So uh, a lot of people continue to ask the questions. Uh, uh, how do we 100% sure is this one is not that one? This is not this tool designed for. That one you need to do one lab. So here is that we just gave you the leads. This is most likely to be, but it cannot tell you what 100% sure, just because the 
um, this is what omics is exploratory information and uh, insight and prioritize uh, prioritize your uh, different hypothesis so our last one we are going to talk about is the uh, multi omics more generally how do we uh, link metabolomics to the exposomics actually exposomics are really multi omics it's uh, because exposure we are talking about uh, a lot of a lot of omic omics to study so what does exposomics data looks like and uh, here is uh, one of the published studies we talk about omics data and if you see the omics data you will see the epigenomics this is method dna methylation data this is gene expression data and this is a proteomics data this is metabolomics data and this is a serum metabolomics metabolomics so this is naturally multiomics but it is more than multiomics okay it is have a external uh, uh, exposure like uh, the environment like air pollution noise and, uh, and so traffic and uh, air and water so if this is a lot basically if you study exposure omics you need to understand environment and also personal if you are aware some uh, um, uh, is what's the exposure related to chemicals uh, uh, and um, and uh, the other ones uh, diet smoking physical activity sleep and the social stuff so there's a lot of emphasis on health and uh, uh, not just preventing the disease. So we need to monitor environment, monitor personal uh, lifestyle and exposure, and together with multi-omics data to actually improve the health outcome. So health outcome, uh, what are they related? It's uh, about birth weights, um, the BM, BMI, and um, some other uh, stuff. So overall, that how do we understand this multi-omics data together within the context of this environment and personal choices and linking them to that so we can maybe change the some modifiable behaviors and to to uh, improve the longevity or health so um uh, the understanding here is that mountain omics is uh, uh, quite a, a core for exposomics um the other actual stuff is called a complex metadata and uh, I mentioned in uh, our lab session, the last one, if you really want to do is you need to really think about uh, uh, complex metadata. So metabolites already have the support. And if you're using other omics uh, analysts, we also support in complex metadata because complex metadata became a norm. If you study human, you don't have control and you have to consider a lot of factors. So um, uh, this, if you're using uh, our, Include metabolist or other analysts. You use it. You, you can upload a, um, a metadata table, and metadata table is, is very noisy. It's not like a, a table generated by a machine. You can just generate this uh, gene in intensity or metabolite uh, uh, concentrations. It's metadata table. You compiled manually by uh, physicians, by some um, field uh, uh, researchers. They manually doing that, so you really have a lot of errors, empty stuff. So uh, we cannot just do in some missing value imputations or try to do it. Uh, instead, we just flag some of the columns that people to do the editing. It turned out to be quite uh, hard to get it automated, easy to do, but we managed to get it done. So this is you can see uh, some of the data as metadata table, and this is a lot of them is uh, your note. Some of them uh, have the orders you can order them. And we also allow people to actually view what the metadata looks like graphically to see some patterns to correct. So overall, that uh, multi-omics data or exposomic data, metadata has become norm. So do not think about metabolomics is very complicated. It is not. So uh, the what's coming is become more complicated, uh, big data. So um, we need to embrace that and consider that. And here is that if we do the multi uh, metadata, how can we control it? And for example, here we uh, we show that if we want to test the significance of the between healthy and uh, control and disease, uh, there's metadata. We can need to control the age, uh, uh, BMI, and uh, and uh, some other glucose uh, or tolerance or some proteins, and if it's inflammation or some based on some stage. So overall, that uh, 
we do have tools is called the linear models so it's similar to a t-test but actually much more flexible allow you to embedding a lot of the factors to your analysis and it will allow you to see what are the changes and allow you to um, uh, see the uh, factors of potential interactions overall that um, um, we need to consider and there's tools to help you do that if you really go to the field and you don't have control and uh, multi-factor is really the norm and uh, so how do we actually try to combine different multi-omics data and I showed you before you in a joint pathway analysis using a, a mandelium randomization and GUS SNP to metabolize also to microbiome and metabolomics um, but if we really talk about general how do we do that and uh, one part is if we don't have tools we do a user driven user driven means that we analyze individual data and you synthesize that uh, integrity in your mind because you read the paper you understand it, you come up with a story so this is what people usually do um, but we can actually automate them and one is called knowledge driven and if you have some um, knowledge base and you can map them they know they are talking about the same coherent story and the chat gpt is actually doing <laughs> something like that but uh, the thing for us is we don't have that the brain uh, brain power to memorize everything so the knowledge you actually have a lot of knowledge i uh, try to automatically mapping it out uh, data driven try to find the patterns in that data whether the multi-omics have the similar patterns of changes and the pattern is consistent and you will find uh, that patterns could potentially be meaningful so um, here is a knowledge driven integration and uh, the if we talk about the really boil it down is connecting the dots so each omics data if you're doing a, a significance test and get a significant list of genes or metabolites or, or, or and or proteins and uh, that's the seed because this one is means that they are potential biomarkers potential important um, point but how they correlate with each other and we're talking about we've put them in a joint pathway analysis but uh, sometimes the joint pathways only cover a small percentage of the molecular space and we need to use a big one and what's a big one is a network so network is um, naturally broader and you can put them together such as protein protein interactions is, is, is regulatory pathways a lot of the uh, um, interactions identified from large scale studies overall that uh, uh, network is a much broader uh, uh, broader how to say broader net can catch a lot of things to complement the pathways so we can do pathway analysis within network no problem and so within this big net we hope all these individual dots can be connected with each other sometimes they direct connected sometimes they don't direct connected they need to walk one more step have an, have have one neighbors to connect them why we don't marry so why they need a neighbor sometimes the neighbor is not in is not being married so we didn't see the neighbor so because we didn't marry it sometimes the neighbor actually is uh, subtle so they didn't pass the threshold but it's very important so overall that you use network you can find a module hopefully uh, all your signals converge to that module it seems that a lot of things change it and you focus on the module focus on the function and this is what um, we try to do once you identify the module you can do the enrichment analysis just like uh, what uh, your ta showed you you see a heat map you see some patterns change a lot and you want to understand what what are the functions so here is the same thing we don't this is not a heat map but it is a network we can identify modules that have a lot of changes then we perform enrichment analysis and on that and see what uh, what they are talking about so that's um, that's called a network analysis and here's data driven or module driven integration so in this case we we assume it is now model species and uh, microbiome and stuff we just want to see two omics data how they actually share some patterns of changes so we don't know uh, their biology we don't use biology just use the two data uh, data matrix themselves and uh, this is mainly use some dimensionality reduction like uh, similar to PCA but we try to rotate them and see whether they match and if they match how much similarity they are so here it, it shows that um, microbiome and metabolomics data and they using an approach called a pie crust uh, not pie crust called a pro crusty uh, pro crusty analysis so it's very common simplest one 
and try to identify coordinate change between microbes and metabolites. So there's more advanced one, but here it just shows um, what um, uh, what's the simplest one, but I give you an idea about uh, dimensionality reduction, PCA-based approach. So um, and now is the way to introduce these tools uh, and our overall design is uh, uh, the raw data has seemed big and noisy, but uh, we um, individual omics will more or less make it um, uh, standardized, uh, streamlined. From LCMS, we're doing metabolic analysis. We can get the functions and get signature features. From RNA-seq, we use express analysis. We can get a lot of signature genes. And from uh, 16S, we can do microbiome analysis. We can get the uh, microbiome um, tables and um, signature features and taxonomies. And now we can annotate, uh, put them together using omics net, which is knowledge-based, network-based integration. And I'll use omics analyst, which is uh, data-driven. Basically, we use some dimensionality reduction to put them together and show the common patterns. So uh, here is uh, more slides on the omics net. And the omics net is really designed to, uh, to be intuitive, to be e easy to use with a very good uh, graphical support. And uh, the idea is uh, uh, you you get a seed, you get a dots, and you just uh, individual like a SNP, like a genotyping, what SNPs you are looking for, what significant genes, the proteins, metabolites, and even peaks and microRNAs, transplant factors, microbes. And you put them together and they will go and search our underlying data knowledge base and try to find how they are connected. And sometimes the direct connection, sometimes need a neighbor to walk one step further to find the connections. And eventually they will con uh, con connecting the dots and have this edges established. And suddenly it's not individual dots, it's become connected dots. Once it became connected dots, it became network. And uh, now you can do a lot of network analysis. So um, uh, so network analysis is uh, by itself is uh, almost, uh, how do you say, it's, uh, it's an art because um, it, uh, it uh, it's most people is uh, just using visualization plus enrichment analysis to get some feelings. So we understand that a lot of network analysis is Im important, but also it's uh, we want to engage users to engage, understand, uh, use your biological background to really see which one is more important. So we spend a lot of time making it a 2D, 3D, and try to make it structurally more meaningful and intuitive. And you can see some of them uh, is actually this um, is default. If you just go there and do a bit, you will get a similar result and have a lot of the uh, good visualizing results. You can make it more uh, art if you like it. Some people really want to spend a lot of time on that. And it's all directly on the web. You don't need, need to install anything. And the engine we use is uh, actually people use designer games, I think. Uh, we can use the same thing to design a, a visualization for science. So actually it's uh, uh, working well. So the tool is, uh, is similar to what we have done with MetabAnalyst. Uh, we do have some interfaces allow you to in, in, input different types. So after input, you can input the one, two, three, and I think up to five, and you can just based on types input. If you up to five, you'll get five lists. And now you are going to use the database. We have multiple databases for different purposes. And you just select one, and based on this two is connecting with this database, and this two connect with that database. Eventually, you're going to uh, use the database for, uh, to build these uh, connections for each of the input. And hopefully, some input will be common, and uh, not common to all, but at the bridge different uh, dots and make it connected. And, uh, so you created a network beyond the seed, slightly expanding it. Now, after you create the individual, you are going to really merge all these five individual networks together. And sometimes it can get very big just because they are so far away in you know, order to connect that you have to walk multiple steps. And in that case, the more far away than the less likely it's going to be trustworthy. So you need to have some control. If it's too far away, you have to trim it. And we only want to be direct connection or you connect with probably one step. It's one step we call it the first order network. So you have doing one step, you find the partner, you connect with the other dots. Overall, that, uh, this is a common practice. If uh, you are new to Metab new to this network analysis, you need to read a little bit on literature about how the network is being done. So uh, I can give a workshop on that, but uh, 
unfortunately we just uh, tell you what's the common practice and uh, this is all well established acceptable and you get a lot of the <clears throat> networks and uh, most time the network we are going to find is uh, one big continent and uh, 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 you most of the genes metabolites of interest will be concentrated on that then there's a lot of small satellite or orphaned nodes like that so it's just like uh, normal distribution and we always find the same patterns a huge network and a continent and then with a lot of small island so we, if we do that it's always the same thing like that most of our folks are going to on this huge island and uh, a huge a huge continent so we can always visualize explore and trim it and customize it this is something i spend uh, two minutes to really make it more uh, spreading out and uh, less overlap you can change background and you can see where each node on the left is individual nodes. And uh, you can see, you click on it, it will highlight on here. And you can also do some pathway analysis and do module analysis. And here you will identify, this is a, a connected network. And you can also find a more dense connected within here. And you can do uh, function analysis. Overall, that uh, omics net allow you to create a network, customize network, and view individual nodes and do the module analysis, do functional analysis, and uh, go zoom in and find more. So overall, that uh, you need to think hard and what the story you are getting. So there's a lot of flexibility. And if you change at a certain step, you're going to have some difference in the result. But this is expected. So uh, a lot of people like it. Why? Because it's allowed them to think creatively, think uh, uh, back and forth to really find out what it's uh, about. So if um, so, this is why we develop the tools to give uh, open-ended, so you can uh, uh, think more. Of which uh, of which uh, story is based on data is most likely, and what your next step is going to be, and it cannot be uh, that fixed. And here's some arts. So uh, when you get to some stages, you really uh, want to relax your brain, and. Uh, <laughs> You will get some arts like this, and you can do a different uh, uh, layout, and looks quite uh, quite uh, interesting. And uh, and this is uh, some three D. So we really want to actually uh, look into the possibility: can we improve our dimensions, visualizing from two D to three D? And here is uh, I mentioned that if we play games, three D games, we can do the same thing, have a three D network. And uh, each network, we can have a modules, entry modules in, wrapped inside a bubble. So it's became more simplified. And we can click this uh, bubble and make it to be a focus and all the background will fade, fade away. Then we can actually rearrange and extract it and see what's inside this uh, uh, network. And you can see here microRNA with a lot of things, probably the major regulator. So the thing that you see the pattern, you zoom in and you're doing more focus analysis. This is a sense we found out is have a multi-omics complex system. We can make it simpler and still get what you want. And the hidden goal, actually, we, I want to tell you is we want to really put into VR. We want to see and touch in a virtual world. And this is why one goal is not just for 3D. We really have uh, things. But eventually, we didn't uh, proceed to that uh, thing. Uh, the, <clears throat> the goal, at least so far, is still not so ideal and it's expensive. So, But uh, the uh, software part, and we already explored, it seems doable. And uh, we uh, we still put it on park, and hopefully the Apple's or Facebook going to give us some, or Google give us some surprise in uh, next few years. And uh, seeing that all this uh, uh, 3D, 2D is uh, available if you use an Omics Net, and this we published last year, you can get a very good uh, visualizing result if you're using Cytoscape, and this is an online version, and uh, we build it. We developed it actually tried to compete with Cytoscape uh, 10 years ago almost, and actually doing a lot of things better. I don't think Cytoscape can do 3D, and we can do 3D easily. You can drag it around, so it's well-maintained and uh, very easy to use. Next one, we're talking about the omics analyst. So this is one we're actually going to have a niche vertical uh, out soon, and it's data-driven. So this part is we want people to upload the data, data matrix, and to integrate them using a dimensional reduction and uh, uh, to see them in the same space, see what's the shared patterns. So there's a lot of the uh, 
algorithm building. So individual omics, we need to process and identify uh, signal and features to really in, use this as a base, see whether this, where you follow individual omics. But overall, that uh, uh, we really directly use the whole data matrix doing some normalization and uh, 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 clustering and dimensional reduction and visualize them together. So overall, that uh, we have this correlation network, uh, heat map, and uh, 3D scatter plot, which is actually visualize the dimensionality reduction, re uh, reduction, re uh, dimensionality reduction result. So uh, one of the things that uh, omics analysts that we tried, we decided to do is that we don't do a, a very unique individual omics analysis and normalization. We realized that individual omics include metabolomics, microbiome, transport omics, epigenomics. They are very uh, have a unique uh, algorithms for normalization or, or statistical analysis. We uh, uh, we respect that, so we only allow people to upload the normalized data, and which uh, we found is more flexible. A lot of people actually like it, and you can upload it up to five, and uh, then you can visualize uh, pairwise, or you can integrate them all together as uh, a um, um, using uh, several of the dimensional reduction uh, um, algorithms. If uh, someone have tried, one of them is called Diablo, and which is a uh, kind of uh, okay one. And we found out the some time can identify very meaningful patterns that separate in the groups across the genomics uh, result. So here's the one we we can actually show uh, individual omics how they separate in them uh, when multi omics integrate them together. And we can actually see the scores and the loading. This is scores and the load and integral loadings, and see which uh, which one actually drive the separation. You can see these small bubbles here. Actually, that's uh, uh, scores, but it's without a data point. We just basically uh, show that's the separation groups. But you have the arrows. Actually, this is the features how they drive the separations. And here you can actually see more things. Uh, how these things separated, where they located. We put all of them together. They call it a biplot. So this is uh, similar to PCA. It's just uh, multi-omics. They have more advanced matrix manipulations. And uh, here we show that uh, correlation networks, how they are correlated once you identify some features. The good thing is that if you understand biology, and you are comfortable with some this uh, um, uh, high dimensional uh, uh, dimensional reduction, and you go back see uh, these correlated features, you find a lot of them is actually talking about the same stories, and very satisfying when you identify multiple independent different algorithms find the features that uh, more or less point to the same uh, same relationships, and there's much more confidence. Okay, uh, that's why we choose to uh, give you the correlations and dimensional reductions because uh, uh, multi-omics and uh, still give you false positives. But when you use different approaches and you see they're telling the same stories and you gain more confidence. So uh, this is a um, past last uh, few slides. And uh, so um, I already mentioned earlier, uh, uh, five slides uh, away, we, we just mentioned that we tried a uh, 3D three-dimensional, we want to try the VR, but uh, it seems that goggles and VR uh, device is not ready uh, soon, which I hope is ready now. And and it's unfortunate they, they are slow. So, uh, um, but now we have new toys and we really want into this uh, chat GPT on the spot. And it seems they are very promising. So the issue is that uh, uh, we have the interface, we can design interface, allow you upload and do it, but actually we can do it through the conversation as long as they understand what you're doing and confirm with you. And if you're doing something not possible, they will give you some warning, tell you don't do that. So overall that uh, uh, the understanding of the omics data analysis is uh, became very standardized. So if you attending the lectures from morning to now, you should feel that the pattern, this pattern the knowledge going to be a very, generalized so the if we use the chat gpt or large language model training them to doing this it's definitely they can understand so our our natural language is more flexible and when you refine it or confine it to this metabolomics let's see and it can get very accurate so overall that uh, a few years from now we should be able to get there 
So whether we can get a 3D interaction like this guy, I don't know. But at least uh, you even it's multi-omics, I think it will be easier than what we experienced today. And I think as in three years, we should get there. Yeah. Thank you.